It's great to be here, and uh, I appreciate that. Uh, how many of you at times in life have felt that you were not fully equipped? You ever have that feeling? <laughs> That's right. Uh, I know when I uh, took my uh, wife to be out to, to dinner, and I said, order whatever you want on the menu, and she ordered whatever she wanted, and, and then it came time to pay the bills, and I left my wallet at home. Those things happen. So. Um, another circumstance that happened to me personally was back, um, was back in 1997. I was the, uh, the Western Regional Coordinator for an organization headquartered back east called Rutherford, and uh, I was coordinating litigation in the western states out here on the west coast, defending uh, faith, family, freedom. Well, uh, what happens in life when everything is really on cruise control and everything's really nice and things are finally stabilized after five years? That's right. <laughs> or as we say in Texas, a big cow gets in the middle of the road and you have to go left or right or have lots of hamburger meat. And um, so, it's those of you from Texas, I hopefully made some connecting there. But um, anyway, that's what happened to me. Uh, the national office called me and said, Brad, we're closing down the regi your regional office. Uh, but don't worry, we have a full-time uh, uh, promotion for you. Once you head up our, our new public affairs office in Washington, D.C., you'll be the media point man for all of our cases all of our litigation across the country. And, um, and so they went ahead and, uh, and uh, by the way, is the volume on? Is You're good. I am? Okay, good, because I always forget to push the button, so I wouldn't be a good president, would I? No, <laughs> <laughs> that was a joke, okay. Anyway, um, so um, yeah, push the button, the red button, okay. Anyway, um, <laughs> so as it turns out, um, the national office offered me this promotion head back east to head up their public affairs office and to be the media point man for all their cases, all their litigation across the country. And so then I, uh, you know, I said yes and didn't have to really pray about it because God was obviously closing one door, opening another door, so you don't have to pray about those things. You just, you know. And then I had insomnia and I couldn't sleep. And I was double minded, still couldn't sleep. And then finally I realized, great, I'm going to have to pray about this. Now, why did I have that attitude? Why did I not want to pray? Simple. Because I had a good idea that when I prayed, God was going to convict me to go the hard road instead of the easy road. The easy road was simply take this job and have security. So I prayed, and when I did, the first question that came to my mind was, Brad, what desires has God put on your heart? What passions, passions has He put on your heart, my mind? And oftentimes, God puts passions on our, our heart and minds, and, but we don't do it because we think it's about us or we, we let fears get in the way. <coughs> and it's real easy in ministry to do that, isn't it? Or in the workplace to do that. Well, I, uh, I felt convicted, so I said with boldness and courage, I said, yes, Lord, I will rise the call. I will rise the challenge. I will go on several conditions. <laughs> and Because um, I was really scared. And it's okay to be scared when God's calling you and convicting you. He can convict you to do something and you still feel scared. Because that's where faith comes in. There's this, this, vac this difference there that we have as Christians, and God uses that. In the Bible, you'll notice that's, that God often we, we will stretch people. He uses He stretches them. So I was, uh, I felt really. I just want to make absolutely sure this from God. So He gave me just a few little minor requirements. I had to have free office space donated indefinitely in Sacramento, <laughs> California. I had to be kept on the radio stations for free. That two, two that interviewed me weekly. Um, had to be. Uh, have a computer system donated, stay on the radio, free office space. Uh, we had to be in the black in three months, three months. Um, oh, and I was never going to ask anyone uh, for anything, uh, to, you know, we never charge anyone for anything we ever do. I thought it was very reasonable with my business model. Don't you think it's a good? <laughs> so, um, yeah, I had no idea how much I was really testing things. But uh, God came through on all of them. And by God's grace, we now have not just one office that's free rent, no rent. We have five offices rent-free in California, up and down the state. God's awesome. And uh, he knows how I'm wired. I hate to waste money on rent. He knows his time. He could have given a big grant for it, but no, he knows how I'm wired. God knows how each and every one of us are wired. And, uh, and that's really exciting. Uh, and then um, on the radio stations, there were two that two kept, kept me on weekly. Well, now there's over, uh, in addition to having a, sh a show on uh, K-Wave, 107.9 FM. You guys ever hear that station, K-Wave? Yes. Well, you've got to listen to 10.30 at a.m. in the morning on Saturdays. This is an awesome show. This guy at 10.30, okay, it's me. <laughs> but it's a really good program. It's called Pacific Justice Report. 
and uh, I think you'll enjoy it. It's very different um, than what you may be uh, used to used to hearing at times. But um, so God did that, and then in addition to that, we have uh, our Legal Edge is her, our commentary. One minute commentary is heard on over 200 radio stations across the country, all for free. We don't pay for any of this stuff, and it's just how God works, and uh, He makes it really clear. Uh, when we're, uh, which is really freeing when, when we realize it's his baby. When I first got started in ministry, I thought this is going to be Brad's ministry. <laughs> Serving Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then God taught me, no, no, no. No, no, Brad. Right from the beginning, he says, no, no. This is God's ministry. And by his grace and mercy, he presently has Brad Dickens participating at this time. <laughs> And there's a, a lot of freedom that comes when you realize it's not your baby, it's not my baby, it's his baby, and to see what God does. But he wants us to be open and to do that. I tell you, that's one reason I'm really excited, frankly, um, to get here, or I'm glad I got here early, to learn about what you're doing uh, and what this, this ministry is going about and the tent makers. And uh, I'm ecstatic to see how God is moving in ways that are, uh, that are outside the box, uh, but uh, reaching inside hearts. And, and, and uh, through these new uh, channels. It's just it's so exciting. Now, are we going to be challenged because of our faith? Um, absolutely. Uh, in God We Trust was challenged on a lawsuit. We went before the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. What happened before the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals? Uh, the, uh, I don't know what you're saying, Ninth Circuit. What, what good thing could come from the Ninth Circuit, right? Folks, if in the Old Testament God can speak through a donkey, <laughs> okay. Anyway, so uh, the Ninth Circuit upheld in God we trust on our currency. Last year, the U.S. Supreme Court allowed that victory to stand. Pastor Rick Warren was sued when he, to get, uh, when he was going to give the invocation at the presidential inauguration. We were contacted by his office. The next day, we represented him the next day in Washington, D.C. Argued the case. Uh, as you know, the prayer went on. And, uh, and last year, the uh, U.S. Supreme Court allowed our circuit court victory to stand as well. It's awesome. Circuit, U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals is one of the, I mean, that's the D.C. Circuit's most liberal uh, circuits next to the Ninth Circuit, maybe. Uh, and then the churches have been persecuted. Tremendous headway has been made just recently. San, the city of San Leandro told a church, a four-square church, they couldn't move into a facility that they bought. Uh, we were contacted. We filed a lawsuit. The uh, judge from San Francisco, from San Francisco, <laughs> she, she rules against the church, rules in favor of the city, says, yeah, property tax, revenue, whatever. These are all valid reasons to keep out churches. You keep out those church people. We appealed to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. Once again, the donkey spoke. <laughs> Reversed on all seven points. Wow. Of, of, and, and, uh, and, and a precedent like none before said that negative economic impact is never a valid reason to keep out a church from a community. Yeah. Unheard of. And create great precedent for the other circuits to follow out of the Ninth Circuit. So people, when we think that you know, the rapture, sometimes we, sometimes we act as if the rapture's already happened, don't we? Yeah. Like, okay, buckle down. I just read the newspaper, you know. Rapture hasn't happened. And if God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, then he is still the same God who's moving and, and touching lives and changing play, uh, people and communities. And, uh, and it's, it's exciting, but sometimes we forget that. We get intimidated by things around us. And uh, no, no, it's not a time to surrender. You know, I like canned foods, very good, <laughs> but you don't have to overdo it on the canned foods and, and water stored. I mean, you know, God's still moving, and uh, it's, it's, uh, we're not in the, uh, the third trumpet yet. So um, anyway, <laughs> so, uh, so we've seen lots of encouragement. Even now in the home Bible study, San Juan Capistrano, they were uh, told, it was a couple, uh, we were told they couldn't have their home Bible study in their, in their home. They're one and a half acres, okay? Now, for Southern California, that's like, you know, 100 acres in Texas. I mean, that's, that's huge, okay? So what happens? They're fined once. They're fined twice. They're basically shut, they shut them down. We represent them. We file an action in Orange County Superior Court. Make a long story short, there's now a home Bible study meeting there, and the city has scrapped their old policy, adopted a new policy that we work with them on, a model policy now for all cities to adopt across the country. Um, a, a Bible study was booted out of Anaheim, Yorba Placentia School District. That's not too far from here. And um, they were booted out. People say, oh, it's terrible. It's the best thing. Judge granted a, a, a summary judgment motion. Bible club came back on campus, but because they're persecuted, God moved. 
their membership more than quadruple. <laughs> I mean, that's the kind of God we have, you know. So I want to encourage us not to be d discouraged. Apostle Paul, in, uh, in Acts chapter 22, uh, gives us some really a wonderful model. You know, here he is, he's, he's sharing his testimony, and I'm, I, my whole sermon is Acts chapter 22, expository. I'm going to spare you for sake of time. But I want to make one clear point that I think is real important from this passage. Um, and it's Acts chapter 22, uh, verse 25. Okay, he was sharing his testimony, and it says, As they stretched him out to flog him, Okay, this is really bad. They're really, they rejected him. They're about to flog him. Paul said to the centurion standing there, quote, Is it legal for you to flog a Roman citizen who hasn't even been found guilty? Whoa! Paul has claimed his rights of due process under the law, and he does it in the most non-offensive manner possible in the form of a question. Why does Paul do this? I mean, I don't know about you, but I'd be thinking like, okay, I missed my calling. This is a disaster. Obviously, I'm, you know. Why did he not do that? First, Paul understood it's not about results. Satan wants us to look at results and think that the results are us. Well, for, first of all, that's a part of pride. And if God is worthy of all glory, all honor, and all praise, then, then folks, he's worthy for the results. That's his baby, results. Instead, Paul understood his job wasn't results. His concern was obedience, to be faithful with the calling that was on his heart and leave the results to God. And that's really freeing when we do that as Christians, isn't it? Uh, and so that's number one. Number two is he also understood that everything he had was, a, was, including his rights as a Roman citizen, was a gift from God to be used for God's glory. Everything he had, including his rights as a Roman citizen. And so he would lay claim to his rights, and sometimes he would use his rights. And, and sometimes he would relinquish his rights because he understood everything was for God's glory and including his rights. It's not like, you know, God looks at laws and goes, ooh, they're so dirty, filthy, and those scummy lawyers, ooh, yuck, I don't want to look at rights. No. God has gave us the foundation of our which uh, we have rights, and Paul understood that, and he used those for God's glory, and that's awesome. So um, I want to talk today uh, for about, to challenge us specifically, specifically about uh, opportunity and faith in the workplace. Could we not, right now, can we show that part one of that video? As Christians, the right of expressing our faith in God on the workplace or wherever is an important right. And it's important that we preserve these rights because if we don't, we'll find that we will soon lose those rights. And we would encourage you to not be silent concerning your love for God and your faith in Jesus Christ. Faith in the workplace, I think, is, is essential. And we are called to, to bloom wherever we are planted. And if we are Christian businessmen, then that's our calling in our ministry. The workplace for me has really been an opportunity as a mission field. The challenge is everybody is that they think that you can't do it. It's not legal. But it's protected by the First Amendment right. You have the right to express your religion. A private employer does not need to hide his or her faith. They don't need to hide the identity of their uh, convictions and uh, they're allowed in proper ways to let their employees know about their faith and values. You know, if you're a Christian, you know that we are all called to be salt and light. Uh, the question I have for you is, what is it that salt and light both have in common? Both salt and light radically change their environment. That's what we're called to do. And the question I have for you is, are you changing your environment or is it changing you? This program is very important because there is a major void out there in the private sector as to what people can do with regards to sharing their faith, living their faith, demonstrating their faith. And what happens when there's a void and there's an absence of knowledge? Fear comes in and fear silences people of faith from living and practicing and experiencing their faith where they spend most of their time, which is in the workplace. I will never forget uh, an afternoon, 1976, I was sitting in my office trying to concentrate on my work and very conflicted and couldn't concentrate because this thought kept coming to me that God might be calling me into full-time ministry. And finally, I just stopped and I prayed. And uh, one of those earnest prayers, sometimes you just know you're touching God. <laughs> I just cried out from my heart. 
as sincerely as I could and say, God, you're going to have to tell me what to do. I'm a double-minded man in all of my ways. I don't know which way to go. And I must recognize I have two young daughters. I don't know how to support them. I'm in a family business that may well fail if I leave it. This is a big decision. So if you're going to, if you want me to go in this direction, you almost have to speak to me in an audible voice because I ha can't have any area of doubt in this. I prayed that prayer, tried to go back to my work. I decided to pack it in for the day. So I was just closing my papers. I looked out and here's a guy by the name of Dave McNutt walking in the front door. Now, Dave was a guy at my church, somebody I had not ever spoken to, had any conversation to. I may have said hi, Dave, to him in the lobby of the church a couple of times. But lo and behold, a few moments later, the secretary came in and she said, there's a Dave McNutt here to see you. Well, okay, said him I did. So he comes in, he says, hi, Barry. I said, hi. He said, how's it going? And I said, why, it's just really great. And he sat down on the couch in front of my desk and uh, I had to make a quick decision. He was a missionary kid, probably not into car wax and cool cars. So I decided to start talking about ministry. I said, you know, uh, it's going really good. I, I've had so many wonderful opportunities to share my faith with people and leading some people to the Lord across the country in business situations. And uh, it's just really amazing. And he says, wow. He says, uh, God has given you an amazing ministry here, hadn't he? And I said, well, what do you mean by that? He said, well, it's, I just listened to what you're saying and the people that you've just told me about are all people that a pastor could not reach. But as a businessman, you just can out of hand, just your colleague, and you can just out of hand share your faith. It's obvious that your business is your pulpit. Wow, <laughs> I gotta tell you, I sat back in my chair and chills were going down my back. And I've looked at that ever since and just thought, praise God. God cared enough to speak directly to me and let me know I'm supposed to stay right where I am. And uh, that's worked out pretty well for me. The business has done well, my bullpen has grown, and I just have amazing opportunities to share my faith. I was promoted to vice president of Intel at the ripe old age of 32. I was made a vice president, the youngest ever in the history of the company, and I started running and building this group in video conferencing and internet communications. Well. After doing this for almost four years, it was a failure. And your first big failure in your career is like a big wake-up call. You're praying all the time, you know, why God, what did I do wrong? Clearly, you're struggling with your own pride. I mean, particularly as men, you know, you're so wrapped up. Your ego is so wrapped around your work and your career. One of the things that comes up is that he is a Christian, which means he puts his faith on the line inside of Intel. It can cause challenges in a politically correct environment that can be a little bit tricky to tread on. And quite frankly, I have uh, personally not put my faith on the line as much as that, at least not until I really got to know Pat. I, I sort of felt like Moses or Joseph, you know, their periods of great failure. And it was sort of God's way of extracting some of that pride and ego from me and starting to attack some of the areas that really were preventing me from being as successful and as influential for the kingdom as I might be. You know, there's no closet Christian with me, and I've spoken publicly, internally, at different things about my faith. Everything you do is now on a pedestal, and people are watching your actions all day long. You know, are you going to slip and profane? Are you going to get angry inappropriately with somebody? You know, are you going to be, you know, somehow you know, making uh, uh, inappropriate remarks? All of those things now are being analyzed by everybody around you all the time. You know, my counsel to people is be a great employee. Just be, you know, work hard, do your very best, realize that you're working for Christ and for his kingdom and you're employed here on earth for a particular employee. And as you do that, you can look past an awful lot of the politics, an awful lot of the good and the bad days, knowing that your only reward is for the kingdom. I am not here at this business just to make as much money as I can. This business truly is a platform for ministry. God has entrusted me with this company. I look at it as his company, not mine. I'm just a steward over it, that I'm here to manage the resources that God's entrusted to me. In setting up our mission statement for the company, um, I gathered my executive team in a room for a day and a half, brought in a Christian facilitator to help us talk through that whole process. And as a team, we brought our mission statement down to uh, basically states to glorify God in all we do and bring value to our customers, to our shareholders, to all of our employees, and to our vendors. 
One of the benefits we provide to our employees, which I feel is the most valuable benefit that we can provide, is a corporate chaplain. Uh, we've had a gentleman named Jim Salcedo for the last several years, a bilingual guy, gets along great with all our employees, and is just a great resource because all of our employees at some point in their life are going to go through a major challenge in their life and need somebody to talk to. Uh, not all of them go to church, so Jim's here walking around every week just building that relationship, looking for the opportunity to share Christ with them. Another thing I do just to sh be a witness in the office place here is on our front counter in my office, out in the customer service desk, we have Christian literature. You'll find the monthly newsletter from the Sheepfold, which is a homeless shelter for women with children here in Southern California. You'll find the Pocket Testament League uh, Gospel of John. You'll find literature from the Free Wheelchair Mission, just a number of different Christian ministries. So we are you know, overtly putting it out there that we are Christian without shoving it down someone's throat. But it's neat to have that there because it has started so many conversations where people, while they're waiting for us, will pick it up and look at it. We have a Christmas party. You know, I'm not trying to be politically correct. I'm very overt that it's a Christmas party and I say a blessing at it and uh, just have a great time of celebration and fun with the whole family. One of the things that I have in my office very clearly is a picture of Christ hanging on the wall over my desk. You know, I do not hide the fact that I'm a Christian, that I'm a believer, and um, it's a great conversation starter because anybody that comes in my office, be it employee, customer, vendor, you know, it's very clear over my shoulder that uh, Christ is watching me. And it just gives an opportunity to start conversations and makes, I think, a lot of people feel more comfortable. You'd be surprised how many Christians are out there. You know, as business people, a lot of times we feel like we're the only ones, but if you can be bold in your faith and have some symbol out there, it will open the doors to allow you to be an encouragement to other Christians also. Well, I've actually developed what I call the QC program. It's my QC program. This is my patented program and it works like a charm. QC, first the Q. Q is qualifying people. Every time I meet somebody new, I want to qualify them. And um, you know, one way to do that is say, are you a Christian? <laughs> you could ask that question. Uh, of course, you're gonna offend them in the process most of the time. Uh, I don't ask that, and yet I do. But I do it in a different way that they have no idea what I'm, I'm really up to. I start talking during that first initial conversation, or certainly one of, the, one of the first conversations I have with a new friend or a new acquaintance. And I reference my church or my pastor or somebody in the church. I'll say, you know, the pastor, when he was my pastor, when he was preaching on Sunday, he told this amazing story or had this great joke or one of my best friends at church told me this, or, you know, we had a great time at Sunday and after church, we went out to lunch, something very non-controversial. If they are a Christian, every single time they will light up and say, oh, you're a Christian. Wow. Where do you go to church? We've all done that. We know that's what happens. If they don't say anything back, it shouts the message, they're not a Christian. Okay, so now they're on my, my prayer list. Now I know where I am with them, so I know they're not a Christian. The next step from there is the, the C part of my QC program, and that's chumming. And I love to chum. A Marlon, if he's not hungry, he'll swim right through that, won't pay any attention to, to, the, to the chum line. But if he's hungry, and there's a relationship to this and being fishers of men, you cannot force feed Christianity to people unless they're hungry. They have to be hungry. So what you need to do is just put out the chum and let them go and let them make the decision if there's gonna be more to the program. Uh, when a marlin comes through and he's hungry, he finds that tasty little morsel. Oh, that tastes pretty good. Then he looks, there's another one. And he starts coming up this chum line. He gets the next foot and he gets the next foot and he gets the next foot. And I have to tell you, there is nothing more beautiful than watching a marlin coming up your chum line, coming closer and closer and closer to you and you now have your line in the water with what looks like another piece of chub, but it's your hook. And when he grabs over that hook, you're in for a real ride, but you've got it. I say there's nothing more beautiful than that. I have to tell you, there's one thing more beautiful. There is nothing more beautiful than seeing a non-Christian who's hungry, that takes the bait, takes that little chum that I've thrown out about the church and the pastor, my friend at church, starts asking questions, is hungry, starts coming in and starts coming up the chum line. And so I chum, when I know the person's not a Christian, whenever I'm around, I don't say anything that offends them. 
I just reference, if something happened to them that was amazing, I'll say, boy, God saved you from that, didn't he? Or God must really have big plans for you. And immediately, always, I go right on to, hey, how about those Dodgers? I never want to leave them where they're feeling uncomfortable or that I'm pushing something. They don't, it's just, it just happens. But what happens beyond that is really beautiful because someday they will be hungry. Karen and I pray every day um, uh, to God and tell God we're available. We're available. Our priority today is we're available. Lots of things going on today, but during the day, um, people have a way of coming and, and having needs. And you know what? The people that you've chummed for over a lot of years, sometimes they run from you. I've had some that won't have anything. Not one positive word about God will have nothing to do with it. Like me, don't like God. But you know what? When they come down with cancer, they have a marriage problem, their kid's in trouble, all the types of things that happen in life, and they start pondering real values and where to go, and guess who they call? And my great privilege is that people call me on a regular basis and ask me if I can talk to them. And that's such a privilege. It's just, it's just really great. And we could all do that. And I'm gonna give you instead the, the rapid fire for part two. Pa part two, we talk about specific things that you can do with your faith in the workplace. And I think you'll find these really exciting. Number one is uh, your, your mission statement. A company's mission statement can have glorifying God, furthering God's kingdom. That can be in your mission statement, okay? You can also have open displays of it in your signs. Now this is a really abstract concept for, I'm sure for some of you, but you can actually demonstrate uh, you're in your sign the <laughs> cross or your face. <laughs> oh, wow. No, I'm kidding. So um, that's a classic example. I, I'm going to use that in the future, by the way. Uh, so you can do that also in your products. Have you ever been in an out burger and you look at the inside of the cup? Yeah. Hidden in there is a little verse. That's legal. Uh, in fact, if they want, they could put it in the front of the cup with the printed Bible verse. They, they, they can do that. So long as you don't discriminate against people because of their faith, you know, providing services to them, um, as long as you don't discriminate or discriminate against employees because of their faith in hiring them uh, in, the, in the private workforce, you're free to live your faith as robustly as you wish, which is fantastic. Uh, products, or, or science products. What about uh, pictures on the wall? Can you have pictures like these? Yeah, you can have pictures glorifying God in the workplace. How about uh, music? Can you play religious music in the workplace? Yes, you can. And, and now you may have one employee who says, has a complaint, says, I can't work. This music is, it's distracting me. These, these, these lyrics, you know, they bother me. I just can't work. I can't get my job done. Okay, fine. Switch it to uh, just the, you know, the music only without the lyrics. I would love to have a lawsuit where the plaintiff argues that this employer, still they, the music itself was spiritual warfare. Even though I didn't hear any words, I just knew it was just getting to me, you know. It'd be a, I'd love that case, have a judge declare, yes, there is spiritual war, and therefore, you know, that would be, that'd be wonderful. Um, you can also have Bibles on display. Like in the break room, if you want to, you can, you know, talk to Gideons, whoever, just get a big thing of Bibles and, you know, limit one per employee or customer. Uh, but uh, you could, you know, or however you want to do it, you can do that. G uh, tracks, gospel tracks, as we saw in the video, you can have different ministries on open display for people to, to look at while they're waiting, perhaps, for, uh, to be uh, served. Uh, we had a, ge a gentleman who had a, a swimming pool, he and his wife, in Morgan Hill, and they, had, they gave swimming lessons. And it was an inside enclosed area. It was not Southern California, it's Northern California, so um, it's all enclosed. You know, it's, uh, uh, rains more up there, I guess. But anyway, uh, as it turns out, uh, they were sued because they had Christian music, Christian pictures and things, and. And uh, the parents said, hey, I want my child to have swimming lessons, but I want him not exposed to your Christianity. And they said, hey, we don't force the child to do anything. We just right up front, though, we are Christian, and this is what we do. Lawsuit was filed. We were contacted. We at Pacific Justice Institute immediately represented them without charge, which we do all the time, always without charge. I know you're not believing me. I'm a lawyer. You, you think I've got to be, this is not true. There's a, there's a bait and hook here. There's an Amway presentation. There's something I mean. <laughs> I would say, just trust me, but that doesn't go well with lawyers either. But uh, the bottom line is that we did without charge, and you know what? We won, and the court held. He has the right 
to live his faith as he wishes through his business so long as he doesn't discriminate against customers and employees. Well, what about evangelizing employees? Can you evangelize? Yeah, you can do it uh, directly, uh, sharing your faith. You don't want to have every employee come to your office and, and say, okay, now that we've done an, your worker evaluation, I want to share with you the four spiritual laws, and I want to use you right now to pray. Otherwise, you know, you, know, you, you, can't, you can't do that. You um, can't force people. But say uh, during lunchtime and you know whatever, you say hey, I'm, I'm going to lunch. I want to share with you my uh, with employees my, my my story. Or you know, so long as it's it's no one's forced to have to sit and listen to it, they can they can you can do that. Also, you can send your email out, your testimony via out email to all employees if you wish. Uh, that's another uh, opportunity for for senior ma for managers to do it. And and, uh, and if you're not in senior management, you may want to get permission to find out what the rules are regarding sending emails out. But um, you can do that and just put, say, hey, many of you wonder what makes me tick. This is optional reading, but I decided those to share with you what really is in my heart. For those of you who want to know, uh, here it is. It's optional. They click it, up comes the, uh, your testimony. You can do that. You can have a video if you want to do video, because that's more the hip thing, isn't it? You know, with, with ultra graphics and, you know, whatever, your three heads and two heads and one, and you no, know, never mind. Anyway, some of this stuff's really abstract for me. Yeah, so, uh, but it's, uh, yeah, exactly, Trinity, so. But anyway, so you could, uh, but you can do that. That's, that's, that's great. How about Bible studies? Can you have Bible studies? Yes, you can have Bible studies. And uh, so long as if an employee has a religious objection to participating in the Bible study, then you have to let them opt out. One case up in Seattle, Ninth Circuit case, there was a uh, situation, employee quit and uh, filed a lawsuit. The judge said, wait a minute, you didn't give the employer notice that you didn't want to attend the Bible study and give them a chance to accommodate you so you don't have to attend. You know, you can't expect an employer to read your mind. And so, no, you lose the lawsuit. Employers have a right to have a Bible studies and have employees attend if they, employer, unless they ob object uh, and let the employer know, they can make these available and they can have those. Now, you can also have uh, uh, chaplains, corporate chaplains. These either can be formal ch like chaplain programs. There's two large organizations that do this. Or you can partner with a church, a uh, pastor, a lay pastor, and have them come in. Just make it's really good to have that outside person as a chaplain because you want to make sure there's confidentiality that the chaplain does not share or disclose any of those conversations with senior management. Otherwise, you can have some problems if you let someone go and it turns out you know the day before they share with the chaplain that they're having struggles in a, in a very you know in, a, in an area of, of sin and they're going to say ah he told the manager and that's why he's firing me. So you want to make sure that's really kept confidential. Uh, but you can do that as well. You can have outside speakers in to your business like in the morning on a project like this um, <laughs> yeah anyway so yeah you can do this obviously otherwise I wouldn't be here so I'll move on to the next point um, you have like video projects like the truth project and things like that with the pre-employees you do that during lunchtime if you wish uh, or the first part of the day you can also sponsor this is really awesome mothers of preschoolers mops those are often in churches once a month to get together mothers of preschoolers Companies can have it. A company called Legacy, a uh, company up in Pe Petaluma, uh, started doing this. And they can, it's, it's great. It's a wonderful way of showing c care and compassion for your employees who have little ones. Being a father, I have two kids, eight-year-old and 10-year-olds. Let me tell you, that three, four, or five-year-old, it's a tough time. Mothers need compassion, you know. And fathers, too, when we're watching them. So anyway, yeah. it's really funny. I thought it was, I really thought it was easy being a homemaker. You know, my wife, she has it so easy. You know, she loves the kids and, you know, so easy. Then she had me uh, be with the kids for on a Saturday, just myself, um, for about three and a half hours. <laughs> she came home, she opened the door, and I said, I am so sorry. <laughs> I had no idea. I had no idea what you go through. I said, they're like on ever ready batteries. They don't slow down, they're just continual. <laughs> anyway, that's the side of the song. So, but having that compassion is a great thing, and MOPS is a wonderful way to reach out. Vacation Bible schools. Uh, your, your business can underwrite children, employees' children, attending vacation Bible schools. In fact, you can make a list of all the, vac all the church vacation Bible schools that are in your community on the calendar, just make a whole list of them. Some parents would just have their kids go to all of them, you know, and, and they're probably happy because the kids are taken care of. They don't have, parents aren't worrying, parents who aren't worrying are able to keep their mind on their job, perform better. Okay, that's my business side coming out. <laughs> but, uh, but it's a great idea. I mean, kids getting soaked with VBS all summer long, ah, awesome. Uh, that'd be great. Also, scholarship programs. 
You can give scholarship programs if you wish for employees or employees' children to attend a particular Christian school you know, or a particular Christian college. Like what's one that's close by here? Biola, right? Biola. Yeah, I mean, just Biola. Say $500 a year uh, as long as the, the kid has at least a 2.0 or 3.0 or depending on how cruel you want to be. But anyway, uh, <laughs> but you can do that. And uh, that's, that's definitely possible. Go to that community service. Uh, businesses can actually give their employees away. Say what? Um, take two? Yeah, there's actually an employer who does this for one Friday of the month. Uh, they have groups of employees get together and they spend that day on a community service program. And the, the employer can choose, say, three charities, three programs that they want to do. And if an employer says, hey, these all three are, are Christian, they violate my faith, say, fine, then, you know, you can stay at work. It's your choice. You can work on Friday. So that's, a, that's an option as well. And uh, we can work with you on putting that together. Uh, Short-term uh, missions projects. Can, your, can a company underwrite employees to go on short-term missions projects for one, two weeks? Or, yeah, you bet. Employers can do that as long as it's optional. Uh, you know, in, in, in terms of violating their faith, it says, hey, this violates my faith, this is Christian, you want to be open with it. You want to say, hey, yeah, it's a great resort, we're going down there, it's just beautiful resort, vacation, oh, you've been such a great employee, I just really want to reward you, it's great. <laughs> and then there he is in the jungles, you know, <laughs> with a machete, you know, hearing someone preach the gospel in Spanish to him the whole time, you know, or in Hungarian or whatever. You know, you want to be up front, let them know what's, what's going on. So, anyway, um, that's great. So... What about uh, matching gift programs? You can also have a matching gift program. You know, like there's the United Way. You can do your own thing. And you can say, you know what? We're going to matching gift program. These are the five charities we're going to choose. And we'll do match one dollar for dollar or two dollars for dollar, whatever. Uh, everything that's given by employees, we'll match it to go to one of these five charities you can choose. You, you know, or one charity you can do. You can do that. That's, that's, that's definitely possible. Also, uh, how many of you pay union dues? Anyone here pay union dues? Very good. Wouldn't it be awesome? Anyone else? Raise your hand. Don't be coming to you. Just one person? Okay. Oh, another person. Okay. Uh, well, you know what? Wouldn't it be awesome um, if you had freedom with regard to union dues? And you say, what are you talking about? Well, first off, if you've got a position of leadership or influence in your union, is that a mistake? No. Use that for God's glory. Be a salt and light to people in your, in your union. However, sometimes people are part of a union that supports issues, causes, or candidates that violate their <coughs> Christian beliefs. Yeah, you guys know, probably know what I'm talking about. There's some unions out there that really do that. Well, here's the kicker. That's a Texas phrase, okay? Here's the kicker. Um, under Title VII, you're entitled, every union worker in America is entitled under federal law to have all their union dues, not just the political portion, but all of it, agency fee, fair share, all of it, to no longer ever go to their union ever again and instead be diverted to a charity that's an agreement with the employee's faith. All of it. All the union dues. Applies to every union worker in America, public and private. It's been case law for more than 30 years. Only one in a thousand union workers know about it. Last year alone we assisted 400 requests for union opt-outs. This year it'll be, to be topping a thousand. And so if we can serve you, if you're in that situation, or if you're an employer who have union workers, we'd love to do a presentation on religious tolerance in the workplace and educate them on their rights. Uh, you, two union shops had me come in. I was talking about religious tolerance in the workplace, and I talked about this. And for some reason, they never invited me back. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they were very, very happy about that. Um, anyway, we have just a few minutes left. Let me just say this also. Um, uh, we have Pacific Justice here to serve you. We want to serve you. Um, also, there's some blue sheets here. If you guys, you, could you pass those out now to everyone? Uh, real quick, I only have a few minutes left, so I want to make I want to be respectful. In fact, I would give those to you. And um, if you want us to, if you'd like us to keep you up with our work, we'd love to do that. If you'd like to um, support our work, we'll, you, we'll, you know, you can do that. But also pray for our work as you get our case updates. Really means a lot for us, so we can keep you guys updated. We really want to serve you or your church or your community, all without charge. Let me just finally say this: Sometimes people may say to themselves, "Well, that's a nice talk." Um, but um, I really don't think God can use me, because for whatever reason. Let me give you a real brief story, real quick one. It's a young boy, he was 16 years old, he was driving to school one day, to high school, and a motorcycle was passing cars. And the motorcycle went smashing head on to this boy's car, and the motorcycle went right through this boy's windshield. Smashed the boy's windshield, and also smashed through part of the boy's skull. 
It was a very gruesome accident. About a, a large hole was cut out of his skull just for the brain to swell, the size of a silver dollar, just for the brain to swell. A third of his brain was hemorrhaging, wow. swelling. Uh, he was in critical condition. Initially, his parents were told, if he lives, you may still have to pull the cord. He still could be a vegetable. We don't know. He's had extensive brain damage. When he first came to, he could not remember his younger brother's name. Um, the left told left side of the brain deal with logic, reasoning, analytical skills, and speech communication. Uh, was majorly, majorly impacted. Uh, lost his hearing initially in one ear. His, his left side of his face was com completely reconstructed with pieces of hip bone and, and hard silicon. What happened was it was terrible, um, and yet God is a great recycler. And God loves to take that which the world throws away and do something new. And that's what he did this young boy. Uh, by God's grace, he had tremendous healing. He went on to get his degree, undergrad in finance. Put himself through undergrad with a 3.85 in his major. Finance, using that left side, left logic, reasoning, analytical skills. Worked a couple of years, put himself through law school at the University of Texas. And uh, graduated the top half of his class. And I know him very well. And as you guessed, yes, I am that, that man. Um, oh. There's always someone who guesses it, I can tell, usually. <laughs> and... Um, but uh, the reason I'm sharing this is not so you'll say, oh, there's the Lord's special anointed. He's for God has great. No, 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 no. Talk to my wife after 12 years of marriage or 10 years of marriage. She'll tell you my halo is still very crooked, okay? <laughs> um, yeah, guys want to get, get humbled, just get married. That's half the battle for humility. So. <laughs> but um, anyway, it's another subject. <laughs> but um, the reason I'm sharing this, that's a compliment, ladies, okay. Uh, the reason I'm sharing this is, um, is simply this. If God, is, if you receive the Lord as, as your Savior, if you enter into a personal, real relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and receive his full forgiveness of what he did on the cross, and he's Lord of your life, then you have received an anointing from the Lord to be a witness, to share uh, your faith in him. Otherwise, he would have taken you home. Our God's a very compassionate God. He knows about tax day. He knows about all the problems. He knows about the bills. Uh, he's a great and, co and, and compassionate God, and he would take us home, but for the fact that he wants to be glorified through us here this day and this hour. And he's given us everything we need to be used for what he's called us to do, and that's to display the love of Jesus and the good news uh, and redeem, of God's redemption through Jesus Christ. And uh, so that's my exhortation to you. It's not about us, bottom line. It's all about him and what he wants to do through us and whether we in faith are going to be willing to step outside our comfort zone in the workplace to make that happen. Let's pray.